So we have a very, very uh, much anticipated next panel um, or town hall, uh, the promise of video targeting. And um, our moderator is Jess Santoro, the senior vice president of sales for Vindico, as well as we can uh, invite all the rest of the panelists up as well. That'd be great. On. Oh, my clock's going already. I didn't have my panel up here yet. <laughs> Gracefully. <laughs> okay, I'm in. Okay. <laughs> Who's got these ducks? Anybody have these ducks? Who, who does not? Who did not get a duck? I'm um, somebody did not get a duck. Can somebody explain how these ducks? Because there were ducks all over the bar last night, yeah. and I, I honestly I was like, why didn't I get a duck? <laughs> Wasn't there a duck contest or something, Josh? Is that what this was? <clears throat> well, we had a. Uh, my name is Jess Santoro. Thanks for the introduction, Michael. Um, we had a little whiskey and wine tasting before our panel, and we thought this would be the, the duck you. So if, uh, if, if you disagree with something somebody says, just throw the duck. duck them. All right, uh, I got a great group here today. And, and um, all kidding aside, we didn't, we, we didn't need whiskey and wine to, uh, to get a conversation going as we've been talking throughout the last couple of days. So I've got a kind of easy job. I'm going to throw some things out there, and I'm going to let these guys run with it. I, I'm going to float around a little bit. Um, I'd love to get some participation from the audience as well. But, um, and we couldn't have a better segue from Jonathan's uh, as far as uh, what our topic is, the promise of video targeting. And so, um, just as quick introductions and we'll get right into it, my dear friend Kathy Hetzel, she is the corporate president of Rentrack, Mike Cheney, CEO and founder of Piston, Chris Paul, he is the general manager of Audience on Demand over at Viviki, and Chris Denny, he's the senior vice president and uh, group director over at Hayworth Media and Marketing. So um, we've got a great cross section of insight here and uh, we'll just kind of kick it off. Um, we could probably go a few different ways with this conversation. We're going to do our best to try to avoid some of the um, topics that we've kind of gotten rutted into, even though they probably do apply. Uh, it's interesting. We have a lot of conversations about metrics and just common metrics across impressions, and now we're going to make that even more complex. So we'll, we'll try to stay away from the, the deep metrics conversation. But um, we're going to focus on the, really this promise of, uh, of video targeting. I'd like to start with a, more of an anecdotal kind of story, and then we'll, we'll kick it off. Um, I started this business in the mid-90s. Uh, in 1999, I was at BBDO, in the National TV Buying Group, and a company came in to present to us in our boardroom. And it was uh, Wink, Wink Communications. Who remembers Wink? Wow, OK, this is great. You just all dated yourselves. Um, <laughs> Wink uh, had a very, very simple promise. And I, and I, I took it verbatim. Uh, we'll, it is a new capability to make television a one-to-one -one consumer marketing vehicle. And the example that stuck with me and tends to stick with everybody is that Friends and Jennifer Aniston example, right? You're gonna be able to sit there and watch Friends and Jennifer Aniston's gonna have a sweater on and you're gonna be able to buy that sweater right there from your TV set. And so you know, that was video targeting back then. And so naturally video targeting has evolved the definition and it's much more robust than we probably defined it. That was 15 years ago. Um, we've seen some companies be successful, come in and out, some be not, uh, less successful. So I'll just kick it off and we can uh, go right down the line. Either, any of you guys can take this. Um, group as a whole, ultimately, do our marketers even care about really going down that rabbit hole of one-to-one -one communication as opposed to the one-to-many or even the one-to-few model? Who wants it? Kathy? Sure. I think marketers really care about targeting and finding their audiences. I don't necessarily think that marketers believe in this just one-to-one. -one. It's not scalable, and it's um, really not a great proposition. But I hope so, because I'll tell you that Rentrack spends our time trying to get at every form of measurement across every platform for television and video, wherever it lays. And that information really, uh, we gather at a census-based level so that we can help audiences match their lists, help marketers match their lists, 
and to be able to find their targets wherever they're watching, whether that's on a TV screen, it's delayed on DVR, it's available on video on demand, it's available online, and when it's available on a mobile phone. And to be able to understand where their audiences are viewing who are, for example, in the market to buy a Lexus versus a BMW. Um, uh, all marketing used to be one-to-one. -one. It used to be a guy with something to sell. Someone wanted to buy it. You had to convince them of it. They gave you coins, rocks, sticks, whatever the currency was at the time, and the deal was done. And then with mass media, it became you know one to many, and everyone was like, "Wow, look at all the money we can save." And consumers got smart, and the consumers were like, "No, I'm just not going to buy your line of thinking. I want something more." So now we're trying to find a way of using technology, mass marketing, the other way to go back to a one-to-one -one or a or one-to-a-few type of uh, of uh, of marketing. And you know, the issue is we may be able to do it with technology, we may be able to do it with media, we may be able to do it with video targeting, but saying something different to everybody, um, you know, like you've seen earlier in the past couple of days from a creative point of view. You know, something that resonates to everyone that's universal is much more compelling than a one-to-one -one thing, and especially with video, where it gets very expensive to tailor every single thing. Um, it's it's a big challenge to be able to do that. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think I'd love to kind of dig into that a little bit. If, when you talk about the creative, um, creative is expensive, right? Uh, uh, so, Chris Paul, yeah, I mean, can you, be, this yeah. is the world you live in. <laughs> yep. You're an audience on-demand guy. <laughs> How do your clients then even look at the creative process and how does that get woven into the media planning process um, when you are pushing this model forward? I mean, it, it is the eternal struggle to try to find a way to explain to advertisers, you know, and it's not always the case. I mean, it's true. I think most advertisers are uh, trying to take advantage of what we can do now in terms of targetability. I think the, the rise in, you know, my world, the, the advances and the investment in, in exactly what I'm doing right now are testament to that. But um, what I'm trying to push with the uh, marketers who work with us is the idea that your initial contact um, should be targeted. You don't have to go nuts on the investment to have thousands of different ad versions based on your different segments. But because we're in an interactive medium, that is not the end of the conversation necessarily. So you can be much more targeted and much more uh, customized in the second, and third, and fourth responses after you see that. You know, so you can hit them with a video ad and then ask them a question. You know, if we get ourselves out of the broadcast way of thinking and continue to realize that there's always an opportunity for two-way communication, customization can happen in a much more scalable way and, uh, and hopefully much more uh, effective way. So let me take something there and move it over to Chris. So you're, you're referring to kind of this end user experience, right? Yes. Uh, ultimately, you're talking multiple exposures and you also made the, the delineation between, so you know, frequency is an interesting topic. Frequency is a blunt object in, uh, in television. Uh, I, I watched the NCAA tournament, I was a frequency of 100 uh, on all state ads. Um, and then frequency online tends to be something we all get scared about. So how do we, in this one-to-one -one model, how do we best kind of manage frequency or storyboard frequency that will get us to an end user experience? Well, I'll work backwards on that one for you. I think I'll build off of what everyone's saying. I think the question really that everyone's here to talk about is video and that overarching question of video, TV versus online, and really isn't it all just video. But the, the reality is I think the first question is everyone, to your initial question, I think everybody's interested in one-to-one -one marketing. I think at the end of the day, we're all trying to sell a product or a service, et cetera. At some point in that relationship, it should be one-to-one, -one, but just, we have to look at it as a, it's a process. And, is TV really the best vehicle to try to develop a one-to-one -one relationship? Right? Is that its best use? It's, it could be, but we should be thinking about it. Is that really its best use? Are there other places, as you bring them to, through the process, that you can do a more customized one-to-one -one, um, message? And then, to your point about frequency, I think that is then, as we talk about tools and measure and being able to track people through that process, to be able to customize my message is the way to manage that frequency. I shouldn't be hitting a frequency of 100 with the same message. We're, we're all doing a disservice to our clients if that's happening. But it, we also shouldn't just be 
looking at it going, I can't customize the messages because I'm working in this broad media vehicle when the reality is we, we have the tools available to us today to personalize it. But Can we talk a the bit about pilot. addressable television? Mm -hmm. um, because I think what I see in addressable television is that it is becoming the direct mail or the direct response vehicle for TV, and it's growing. Um, today, um, it's available from both Dish and DirecTV and Cablevision, and it's beginning to scale with, of course, Comcast making their announcement that they are going to be rolling out addressability, and by the end of next year, we'll probably be in front of 60 million homes. And I think that if we were to take that targeted addressability capability and then dummy it down to an 18 to 49 demographic, well, guess what? Um, we've lost half the audience because baby boomers in six years will be gone, um, and they're outside of the 49 demographic, and I think we're all still buying products, and I include myself in that um, out, already out of the demo target. But if we start to target more around the products that these homes are likely to buy, and we begin to narrow that conversation with people that are in the market to buy a specific kind of vehicle, and I'll use Obama um, as an example. Obama worked with Rintrack and provided us a list, a voter list, registration list of their own with their own characteristics in it. They only gave us segments A through G, so we didn't even know exactly what the makeup of the various segments were. Generally, a political campaign buys about 18 networks deep. Obama bought um, 60 networks deep. Um, they bought things like TV Land, for example, um, and because that is where they found this audience that they were looking for based on the demographics that they knew a lot about. And guess what? They had one day to make a sale, and they made their sale. They used addressable television, and they also used much more targeted linear TV buys. So will the Republican campaign now next year or the year after? I hope so. Say, hey, the people, that you, if you're a Democrat, you watch a, a TV land or you know some of that type of programming. That's a, that's interesting that it got that granular. It got that, that granular. Small. Yeah, yeah. But the, okay, so you, you've now opened up the conversation with addressable television and and, and some of the advances we made there. And I think so, uh, there was a comment made earlier about just infrastructure and the and the plumbing behind that has always been one of the biggest challenges and why we're referencing something from 15 years ago that was supposed to be something that was gonna come out that year. But so, in your model, you're talking about one to a few, right? You've gotten right. it down to a, a very defined and, uh, area. And then you have this programmatic, programmatic buying model that's moving forward more rooted in the IP-connected delivery space that is even more precise. Um, do, do you think clients are going to have a difficult time looking at similar yet different targeting models and scaling that out? And then furthermore, how do they then determine what is the true return on that investment? Because there's a lot of time, sweat, and money that goes into this kind of stuff. That, that broadcast model is easy. You know, this is uh, twice as much, much manpower and people to do this. I hope some of our collective partners are still out here, and maybe you want to jump in and talk a little bit about how you're using information from TV to target online. Anyone? <laughs> All right, way left. <laughs> Thanks, um, Chris from Collective. Uh, yeah, so we're, uh, we're we have an exclusive relationship with Rentrack, um, which has been great for us um, because in the ad network space, it clearly differentiates us. Um, and we've been partnered for over two years now, and we built a product called TV Accelerator. We're able to take second by second viewing data and target people uh, based on their TV viewership behavior and retarget them online or across the different screens. So we're able to do that by saying, hey, we can look at audiences that have watched ABC programming or have watched Modern Family and then go to advertisers and say, okay, Coke, for example, we know that you bought the 842 slot on ABC. These people saw the ad. These people did not. These people VOD'd. And we're able to go out and target those people based on what the advertiser wants to do, increase their reach, increase their frequency, or we can go to Pepsi and do some conquesting or things like that. So there's a lot of different ways that we use the data, plus we layer in our own data to add additional targeting like demo or purchase intent or things like that. But the root of the product comes from the run track data that we have on an exclusive. 
So Hopefully let me that then helps. throw it to one of the Chris's. So from the agency perspective, how are you using this? So here's a, here's a product that has been put together. Uh, Chris Paul, in particular, uh, very interested in, in you know, the, that audience on demand model, really driving things down to the, as close to the one-to-one -one as you can get. Um, how do you start employing these tools? Well, I mean, it's, it, it can sometimes take a lot to get uh, clients out of a broadcast mindset. You know, it's, it's just, you know, we've been doing it this way for so long, you have certain assumptions built into the way you do your planning that um, it just doesn't take into account the fact that, as I said before, there's a two, an opportunity for two-way communication every single time you connect with somebody uh, in the digital environment. Every single time you put a message in front of someone, there's an opportunity to ask for feedback. Um, on top of that, you now have the ability, because we have so much IP, to your point, IP delivered content and ads and everything else, that you can start to actually bridge the gap between these different channels. And we're really just seeing the tipping point on that right now. So what you have to find is a client who has that need for that level of addressability. Um, you know, an example that I worked with, tried to work with years ago, when this was first kind of coming to, uh, coming to be a possibility, this was in 04, um, a client like Pedigree who wanted to focus, who wanted to hit dog owners, right? It's pretty straightforward. Some houses have dogs, some don't, and they can be right next to each other. There's no zip plus four proxy for dog ownership. You know, you either have it or you don't. There's a way now to connect um, that closed loop data on uh, you know, you know, in-store scans and things like that for dog ownership, you can merge those databases, and then you can use something like a TV accelerator product to, to map to those audiences, uh, both uh, in TV and extensions in digital, and you have different levels of customization in each of those cases as we've been discussing. Um, but I think the, the core of it is, is finding that client who really needs this and, and is, is, you know, more aware of what the possibilities are so that they can direct all of their different agencies creatively, media-wise, um, you know, to come together on that particular effort. I, it's, not, it's not easy. I would, I would raise the issue of, if you're talking about someone like that, you know, with that kind of, I mean, it's a broad target, but it's narrow at the same time, wouldn't you have, would have fixed some pool of marketing capital, wouldn't it be better to go purely online where you know that you can reach them with the message. It may not be on a large screen in broadcast, but it's so much more efficient, so much cheaper, um, and much more measurable. In, in, and especially if you're selling online, totally measurable. Um, I wonder if we'd find an argument with, uh, with measurable, yes. Would we find an argument with it is more efficient and cheaper to do it online and to gather, gather the results uh, at a scalable level? I think it'd be hard pressed to sh sh currently sh I mean, prove that it's more efficient, but I think we could probably, I mean, that's part of what we're trying to get that's to what with we're this summit is exactly. what's the measurement that can show that it's truly more effective. Because right. it, it arguably, if, if we all believe what I think we all believe, that it's a more relevant, timely message, I it's going to be more effective. Yeah, absolutely. Can I do a quick experiment? Who has an iPad with them? Three? Okay, a tablet. Take your tablet. Okay. Hold it like you'd be watching Hulu. Just like this. Okay? Now, hold it up in front of you over that screen behind me. Does it block out that screen? Does it block out most of that screen behind me? It's pretty, it does, right? So when you talk about screen, we have, I mean, at the agency, we just say a screen's a screen, a screen. Let me tell you why we think that. I mean, yes, there are differences, especially in the intimacy and the things that you can do with a screen. But when you're talking about the different environment of broadcast versus this, and you can even do it with your phone. Take your phone out and hold it up and see. What you'll see is that in the field of vision that you have, this takes up more space than like a 60-inch diagonal uh, flat panel TV in your study unless you're sitting right up close to it. That, and that makes sense, you've all done it and you've seen it. Um, the thing that's a little disconcerting about it is um, the reason why it still feels small is because of its relationship to the objects around you. So this is a big screen and you know it's huge because it's huge because you're standing there and you, you know, you're small, we're small sitting next to it and everything, whereas this, your hand is like right next to it. Now, if you try that same experiment in the dark with nothing around it, you hold that iPad up and everything, you think that you're looking at the biggest screen you've ever seen. 
So when we talk about you know, the whole measurement of the delivered experience to the consumer and everything like that, there's a lot of um, usage and behavioral issues and how people consume media that I think that we need to take into consideration in addition to the metrics and the spreadsheets and the algorithms and everything like that that we're doing. I mean, I think it even comes into play with the tablet example. Like I was watching a hockey game one night dominating the TV. My wife wanted to watch Girls on HBO and I thought I was the hero of the house. I whip out the iPad, fire up HBO Go, hand her a set of headphones, here you go. She's sitting there watching it for 15 minutes. It's like, I can't do that anymore. I'm, I'm getting nauseous. This is not the way I want to watch TV. So um, I have no problem with it. I've, I use my tablet all the time for that viewing. But I think the last point you made about context, yeah. uh, you know, it's not a, sort of a one-size-fits-all solution. It's not, uh, you have to not. pay attention to it. But no, generally, I mean, for the most part, I think we should think about these screens a little bit more interchangeably. And I yeah. will take exception that TV can't be measured. Uh, be, with the census-based currency, you have the opportunity to look at exact commercial ratings. And so you really do... Yeah, right, right, right. I, no, well, that's one measurement. Yeah, it's one. Right. We, and the, the, the reason I say that's Take one measurement is if you're selling something... You got ducked. We sell, I mean, at our agency, about half of what we do is e-commerce. People actually sell things online. Yes. Oakley, Chico's, fashion stuff, all this stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I can measure. So then you've got I the can sales. Tell you, I can tell you beyond, you know, with a reasonable thing that, you know, we tested this, we tested this, does this, this work, if it's not working, in a couple of weeks we can fix yeah. it. Or video, it's not like swapping in a headline, it's a little different. Um, so it depends on what your KPIs are. It depends on what your measurements are, right? I agree. Yeah. So I feel like we're, I, I feel like as a group here, at least in the stage, we're coming back to. Why did I get the duck? <laughs> You, Dude, you said TV wasn't measurable. Um, <laughs> we come back to it, it sounds like the, the IP connected environment, so be it a tablet or a PC or a phone, seems to be the better place to learn about real targeted video. And I think we also just, I think you guys just kind of went a different direction here with, that, with the hockey example. Target video, we talk about targeted content, we talk about targeted ads, obviously the content is the surrogate for the ad. Yep. Um, so that's, that's kind of a whole other direction we can go here, but regardless, how then do we take the learnings? And uh, Chris Paul, you just made the comment that I still have this lens of broadcast that a lot of my video clients look through, right? Yep. So then what is the best way to start applying the learnings of the Petri dish of a smaller, contained, more dynamic environment and start applying them to the larger reach model? Uh, if you're asking me, I mean, it's exactly what you just said. You know, you have to, you have to find somebody who's willing to uh, make an investment and understand the methodology and believe in the methodology that we have to close that loop and say Spending maybe a bit of a premium to use a data overlay or go through the extra effort is actually paying out for you on the back end And there's a great number of advertisers who have been through that already who are now scaling their addressable investment uh, Because they know that already, but if, unfortunately a lot of those clients obviously that's very uh, that's precious information and competitive advantage so they're not going to write a bunch of case studies about it and, and blow it out broadly. They want to make sure that they hold on to that for as long as they can. But um, you know, I, I, it's it's that willingness uh, to to close that loop, and and that's I mean that's the whole trick. And I, I we promised we wouldn't get into a deep metrics discussion, so I don't want yeah. to. But uh, <laughs> that's it's it's that willingness and that commitment uh, to slogging through what can seem like a very complex challenge up front, uh, because you know you see you know, the reward on the other side. And it's, it's the more, you know, sort of progressive, you know, brand managers and folks at the advertiser side who push that agenda forward. And you are right about the sales data because we do get it occasionally, not always, um, from certain clients who may have a product available online and they're advertising on TV and they want to see exactly what impact it might have had for mm -hmm. the purchases online. So we'll get that on the back end and be able to overlay that and look at it and look at the sales data but we're never allowed to talk about it. <laughs> right, right. And, and from, a, from a creative point of view, uh, I mean, addressable media is a really good thing because it lets you, I mean, if you, can, if you know 75%, 50% or whatever is going to be wasted anyway because it can't, you know, if you can get rid of that 50%, that gives uh, the brand and it gives uh, the uh, creative agency more money to work with to better tailor that message because you're not just wasting it on media that's of no, no value to you. I was just going to build off a lot of this to say, I think we all work within an industry of projectability and confidence. If we could say anything with 100% assurance, we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd, we'd all be retired and very wealthy. So I think <laughs> the key, and this is the conversation that we have a lot at, at our agency with a lot of clients is, and I'll, and I'll put this out to everyone, to 
to either push for this or to make it willing, is the more data that we can get from our clients, which we have proven to do, at least can start to measure what's working and what's not working and adjust levers and mess with the media mix and mess with down to environments and what's working creatively to actually have some confidence in the decisions that we're making. That's the sort of the holy grail of measurement. We could talk about it as an industry, what are some tools that we can get past the GRP and all that, but if we can really get our clients to actually share data that they can share, mm -hmm. that's where my confidence gets the greatest, and it seems to work. So let me just, we can talk about, we, we talk a lot of things in industry, as an industry, and one of the things that I think we should try to walk away from at least this discussion with is, uh, we're not gonna figure out every problem here, but so what are the action items, right? What are the things that the people in this room uh, we've got sell side, we've got buy side, we've got intermediaries with platforms in this room. Most of the ecosystem start doing this. What are the action items that we have to focus on then? You know, from an agency perspective, what is it that we have to focus on? Is the agency equipped to do this at scale? Um, what clients or agencies, it's tough to ask what agencies are doing well, but what, what, what categories do you see are really where we should all kind of focus our efforts? And then I would add to that question on the sell side, so there has to be a distribution mechanism behind this audience reach. Um, who are the companies that need to sit down with the more progressive clients, start putting together um, not just the learnings, but the infrastructure and, and, and all the things that we still have to tackle? You know, where do we go next? I, th I mean, I think speaking as, a, as an agency, um, you know, we, we have a lot of clients that we do brand work for, we have a lot of clients that we do e-commerce work for, and where we're actually making a sale online, or where the client's making a sale online, there's not a lot of discussion about measurement, there's not a lot of issues, because it's, a lot of it is you know, very trackable and very you know, hard data, et cetera, et cetera. And money in the bank is money in the bank. Um, on the brand side, and on, in, in broadcasts and other things like that, where there is a bit of a, uh, not a bit, a large disconnect in many ways between the actual purchase of a product or a service and the um, message that is being given to that consumer, I think, I think that's where a lot of, a lot of um, resources and time need to be applied, because I think that's kind of a missing link, and, and it has been for, what, 100 years, 150 years or so in, in the whole business. So let me move it down then on that resources and time comment, right? Mm. So Chris and Chris, um, you, are, you are lacking resources, like every uh, agency culture is at this point, and therefore you are lacking time. So what do you need from the other side of the desk to, in, in, a, in a partnership format, in a data format, in a cooperation format, what needs to get done from the sellers to actually start moving this conversation forward? You wanna go first? You got it. Uh, <laughs> I know you're trying to think no, um, So, you know, I mean, you, you put it in the right context. The partners, uh, the technology providers, who have done their homework to understand exactly where these challenges are, whether it be you know, measuring brand impact you know, of what we're doing and, and getting the brand advertisers a little bit closer to this, as I said, closed loop data mm -hmm. ecosystem uh, is, is terribly important. And uh, for me, what saves a lot of time is uh, technology partners out there who don't try to solve every single problem come to me with a pitch that has, you know, a, you know, oh, we got the whole thing sorted out, you can, you know, put us soup to nuts. That never works. We know that it doesn't work. I used to work in enterprise software. I know it doesn't work. Um, but the people who've said, we've, we've taken this one specific challenge and found a way to, to surmount it. I'll give you an example. I met with a company not too long ago who uh, had a very large nationwide uh, coffee purveyor as their client, and the coffee purveyor was coming out with their own K-cups and they wanted to sell the K-Cups, so they're like, we need you guys to target only people who have Keurig machines. And I was, I was, that was pretty impressive. I mean, that's, that's the toughest target I've ever heard of in my life. So instead of doing the typical ready, aim, fire, they did ready, fire, aim. And I think people have to be comfortable with that idea because we can do this now. They put out their standard advertising and then said in the ad, do you have a Keurig machine? And people can click on that and get a, an offer for the K-Cups right then and there. So that's targeting after the fact, after the initial message delivery. And people who can help the entire ecosystem understand that that's a possibility, that you don't have to go through, necessarily go through the guesswork and the research that we, we typically have done up front, that you can learn a lot after the ad's already been delivered and then target a customized message there. That's a really useful, that's a, that's a sort of, uh, that shakes you out of that mind, that broadcast mindset and really moves the conversation. 
and then, uh, Chris, let me go down to you then. I, we've got about a minute left, and I, then I want to close with a question, and I do want to give some time to requisition any comments from the audience. But so you live in a very broadcast mindset with some of your clients and the way that you, your position straddles your, your organization. So what's your take on it? What, what, what do you need from the other side of the desk to, to move your business forward and give, continue to give the value of your agency back to your clients? Well, I'd say there's three sides to the desk because I think I'll put clients at that table too because I think they have to put a stake in it. I think you've heard a lot of conversations about investing in good creative. I mean, the ACE metrics is a great conversation around the quality of creative. I would go as far as to say media is just as responsible for creating the canvas to do great work, so I would put us on the hook for breaking through. But we need clients to invest their dollars in building those products and building the different experiences that we talk about when we get more targeted. We need sellers at the table who work across their entire organization and bring all of their assets to the table instead of meeting their own siloed objectives that are set forth by them. So it's, if we're gonna create truly unique ideas that we can measure and bring the experience all the way through the process, everybody has to be at the table and we don't get that. Um, and then we as an agency need to start to build better tools or buy tools, and I think to your point, some either we talked about earlier, some agencies don't have the scale and some agencies don't have the powerhouse um, and the dollars behind it, but there still are solutions out there. And if you find the right partners and everyone's willing to sit at the table and do what's right for everyone at the table versus the individual, that's where we're gonna have success. And we have done that, and we're not a large agency. So do we have any questions from the audience? I, I, uh, first of all, who, can I just, again, show of hands, agency folks in the audience? I'm not going to pick on anybody, I promise. More so to get a... I, I, I think I'd be curious to, to understand if, if you all feel like you have the infrastructures and, and, the, and the, the overall systems in place to start having this very, very more targeted conversation uh, on behalf of your clients. But uh, any questions we have for the, for the group? And then I, I'm not letting you off the hook yet. I do have one more question for you guys once we see if we've got anything coming from the audience. Crickets, crickets and ducks. Um, Charlotte Cochran from Horizon Media. Um, my question would be, you know, as we more move towards more of a targeting uh, ability, what type of talent are you uh, recruiting? And is that changing your recruitment strategy? Um, say the last part again. Is so, talents, um, you know, because targeting and data become so a lot more important right. for all of us. Yep. Um, have you or are you changing your talent recruitment strategy? Um, uh, not really. Um, I mean, because we're, I mean, we're organized uh, like a traditional ad agency with account management, creative, media, and we have a very big and robust analytics department, which a lot of traditional agencies don't have. Um, so within those departments, no. I mean, you know, we, f we fire 10% of our workforce every year as a matter of principle. Um, and they know that coming in that there's a chance that they're gonna be, be fired because we don't, we're, we're a professional sports team, that's how we, we do it. Um, and if you don't make the cut, you don't make the cut. Um, so in that sense, the people that we you know, go after or, you know, have to be kind of smart to start with. But we haven't really, you know, I'm not looking for art directors that can also sit down and, you know, create a, a custom data cube or anything like that um, because we have the infrastructure to work all the departments together to, to get that. So we, we haven't changed, no. Um, but on the media side, you know, if you had to look at, you know, some programmatic buying issues and stuff like that that we didn't have five years ago, obviously. But that's probably the only difference. Well, building off that, we're going to wrap it up, and I want one question, uh, one sentence answer from each of you, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get you off the stage. Um, you can just take it down the line. What is going to be your biggest challenge in the video targeting space over the next year? Start with uh, Dennehy. Having the assets to support the opportunity. Chris? Uh, that plus uh, having the inventory and the ability to get at that inventory in the video space uh, in the targeted way. Mike? Um, uh, being able to make the case with clients that it's something that they need to do. Kathy? 
And I would say transparency. The more that we can uh, use our ability to be able to talk about the success stories and share those success stories, then they'll build on themselves and that will help get more clients to get into the dialogue. It'll help the infrastructure support that. And so I think we all as media professionals have a duty to, to talk to each other and, and that's why I appreciate being part of this forum because it gives us a chance to do that. Well, thanks everybody. Really appreciate you guys coming up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Big round of applause right. for our panelists. Thank you, Jess. It was excellent. We have